Hi there, I'm Dara Dandrand. I'm a creative director and strategist, curator, and independent journalist covering immersive technology and the arts. I had the pleasure this year of teaming up with South by Southwest to curate three panels all about the intersection of fashion and technology, how it's changing, the innovations, the frustrations, and what we can expect from the two industries. The following panel is two great minds on it, and I hope you thoroughly enjoy the conversation the three of us had. Please stay tuned and enjoy South by Southwest. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here today. It is such a pleasure to have you, Anand and Sanj. I'd love for you both to introduce yourselves. It's awesome that we can have this conversation at South by 2021. I know that the world uh, looks a little different right now uh, and everyone's sort of making their way and making do, but it's really great to have an opportunity to have both of you respectively in Seattle and London join me today. So uh, Anand, why don't you go first? Please tell me a little bit about your background, share with people what, they, what you're doing, what you're working on. You have a really, really interesting work history. Yeah, okay, so um, I come from an animation background and I've been a designer on the cartoon uh, Teen Titans Go for the past nine years, which mm -hmm. I love, bright colors. And uh, actually one of my favorite parts of designing on there is when I get to do clothing for the characters. Yeah, because of my love of fashion. So um, uh, I do then with VR, I've been doing a lot of um, wearable in VR fashion where I make a garment and uh, there's this uh, VR place museum of other realities where people yeah. can wear the dresses around the museum and interact with them in a really cool way. Um, and I'm just so excited about yeah, the future of virtual and mixed reality with fashion. <laughs> That's awesome, thank you. Uh, very, very cool. And Sanj, please jump into what you're working on. You're also doing a bunch of stuff. You're always doing a bunch of stuff. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name's Sanj. I am the CEO and founder of an innovation agency called Tiger Heart. Um, what we've been working on mostly at the moment is we're doing a lot of stuff within the VR space um and also in the wearable space particularly within fashion um vr i mean we, we we've been working with that technology for a while but it's only in, since the first lockdown in the uk that we started to get a lot of briefs land on our lap um and one of the things that we noticed was that a lot of the people um were interested in you know having this vr experience in the fashion space um but not because they wanted to look at fashion, which was you know part of the experience, but mainly because they wanted to be a VIP. So you know we've had people say to us, "Look, we want to create an experience where you become Anna Wintour and you're on the you know the front row of one of these catwalk shows." And they wanted us to to write, uh, design, and direct uh, an experience where you you know engage with your assistant or you engage with someone on the door who's you know lets you in or and helps you to go backstage etc so that's where we've seen a spike um at the moment particularly that's really cool um and that's that's a very specific very interesting point of view project to work on um so i'm really excited to have both of you here in particular because this panel is about tomorrow's tools architecting fashion's future that's the name of it it's about how we use these tools for innovation, particularly immersive technology, to create and imagine and reimagine how we see the future of fashion going. Uh, fashion and technology, is, they're both industries that are so similar. They move really fast, they break really fast, they turn over really fast, and annually they gross about the same globally in terms of revenue. And people see them as so separate, but they're so similar. And I would love to know your perspective on well, it's a two-sided question for both of you, but one, what are some of the most incredible tools for designing for the fashion industry or designing for fashion today in your respective roles? And then what are some of the frustrations that you come up against in doing that? And and feel free if one of you, uh, you know, has an idea right off the bat. Oh, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> my main tool was Tilt Brush, which Google was developing, and they just they decided to open source it, which is actually a good thing because people can build on it and really expand on it, which is exciting. And already 
it's only been a few weeks and already there's so many new brushes and new tools. Um, that part two people cool. work together making stuff. It's, it's exciting. Um, yeah. Then the other one is gravity sketch. I do a lot in gravity sketch where, you know, you're, it's more like draw, instead of sculpting, it's more like drawing. And I think that really lends itself to fashion design because it's almost like fabric draping and you can get like, you can, um, you know, put your structure of your garment and then get that flow feeling like really naturally and right away, which is exciting. Um, um, yeah, from, from, from our side, there's two things that have kind of um, allowed us to help our clients to innovate. So a couple of years ago, we started to work with smart fabrics um, and we started to work with a specific type of fabric that measured your, your uh, body um and we had a problem with it uh, in that the the industry well consumers weren't really into it because it was this kind of bulky thing that you had to put on so we started to make smaller versions of the product so we started to create versions of it that uh, at first we started off with a shirt then a pair of gloves and where we started to see buoyancy is with uh, feet so we created a, a sock that uh, measures your um it measures five different points on your foot and then from those measurements that data can go to uh, a cobbler and they can make specific shoes for that person so that's kind of where where the idea was two years ago since lockdowns occurred there's been a lot more investment into that type of technology because mm -hmm. a lot of uh well the industry sees it as a an opportunity to kind of engage with their customers in a new way so that's that's kind of a a, a new school innovation yeah. but the old school innovations uh that we've seen so we we work with a tech company that's developed artificial intelligent emails um and we found that uh this technology that we've that we've been uh, pushing to our clients has allowed our clients to increase sales by up to 30 percent over covid um so this is like i don't want to say like an old technology because obviously email you know it's it's not as old as something like pen and paper um but we're starting to see it having a, a renaissance um mm -hmm. in our current era because people are communicating with um with you know in uh, in the purchase purchase uh cycle using that platform that's really interesting um and on on that same note going back to my previous question and what you both bring up um with things like open sourcing tilt brush earlier when you brought that up anand it is great. There are a lot of innovations coming with it, but there are certain companies that are going like Google, like, I don't know if we want to actually invest more time into this internally. And then on the note of what you just brought up, Sanj, you know, where, where are the frustrations there in terms of institutional uh, use cases? I mean, are you finding a lot of people that are going to be using this or is it more experimental? And from both your ends, what are those frustrations butting up? And the reason I'm asking about it is how do we design something better? What's next in the step for this innovation? Oh, well, for, for me, for <laughs> Tilt Brush is I've wanted um, like a chiffon brush forever. Mm -hmm. And I even knew people at Google and I'm like, can't you make this brush for me? And they're like, well, not, not a lot of people are actually using it for that. And I'm like, but yes, they would if this brush existed. But so now with the possibilities of making like custom fabrics or custom materials in there, I feel like the doors are opening for so much more cool things sort of besides the glowing neon stuff, which is like the popular thing right now with, you know, a lot of VR art. <laughs> Oh, definitely. That whole, the, the vaporwave trend, which I absolutely adore myself. Very, very popular. <laughs> but you're right. There, there needs to be more options or, or even outside of having more options in general, I, I think that people need in some ways, and it sounds like this is what you're touching on, Anand, in particular, is to have some real world textures to actually reference, especially with how haptics are growing. That's something else to talk about here in ter terms of innovation tools. Um, and we'll get into haptics later, but uh, things where people can really feel some tangible sense of self, especially if it's working in virtual reality, outside of even augmented yeah. reality, but, but to have something tangible. So I understand your request for more realistic uh, design tools inside of virtual reality. And then Sanj, 
to your point, just to go back to that, do you find that what you were just referencing, it's more experimental or that there is a strong use case and people are seeing that, you know, there is a future? Yeah, uh, well, well, I think the... <sighs> The, the problem we have at the moment is that there there's so many fantastic ideas out there um, mm-hmm. but that there hasn't been a kind of jump into these new worlds like yeah. there's been a little bit of experimentation there's been some exciting um, user cases but there hasn't been a huge jump unless unless there has to be um, and hence why I mentioned um, email um, it's it's a technology that's robust that works Mm -hmm. um so so how do we you know consumers are using it how do we apply that uh, new technologies into that uh, ecosystem so that we can see something tangible uh come back that that's worthwhile um and hence why we're dabbling with artificial intelligence is because we want to we want to you know there's a funnel of activity there how do we kind of explore that funnel activity um with with tilt brush i mean that, that, i think i don't think google really truly understands how exciting that technology is know, that's, that's not that's not to diss google you know they're a fantastic no. you know part of what we what we all do around us but um it's just that mindset that needs to change and there needs to be more people like you know like us um who who can who can kind of bring that to to the masses and get people to explore and 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 spend more time with that technology. Absolutely. And you bring up a point that I think about probably on a daily basis, which is what is that push going to be? And what are those technologies that'll take it further? You brought up AI, which is such an important topic going forward, I think for a very long time. And in a lot of ways it's become very buzzy, but I'm someone that doesn't believe in this dystopic future. I really think that technology, that especially emerging tech, is made to help people. And especially in something like the fashion industry, just to reference this talk overall, people don't really see how tech fits into it. Uh, maybe they understand it for manufacturing, like like factories and, and uh, you know, like fast fashion side of things. But I I want people to understand how many more opportunities there are for using tech in quote unquote unconventional ways to really change the fashion industry for the better. So I'm gonna bring up something very specific. Would love to know your thoughts on this. How do we use something like game engine physics from Unreal or Unity or, or any other program that's doing really cutting edge stuff to cut down on something like fast fashion's waste by using those physics tools to recreate looks like, say, Anon doing what you're doing, Sanj, you two, I'm trying to combine you two, (laughs) doing what both of you do so well and uniquely for work so that if you're designing something in one of these programs, then you take it, you actually calibrate the physics of it, and then you never have to waste the extra fabric in real life. You know, is there an AI component to that? What does that look like? A lot of of what I want to do is basically get those ideas into the right heads so that we can stop being so wasteful for both tech and for fashion. So what types of, you know, technologies, whether you use them or you're curious about them that you're aware of, do you think is going to help that, that sustainability issue? Because it is so relevant to both industries. Yeah. Um, I guess, well, for, I worked on this project over the summer called Fashion of Reality, and I worked with a real designer, Charlie Cohen, and she did this amazing sort of fluffy, warm, upcycled coat that was yet to materialize in the real world, but we were working on it in the virtual world. But we were talking about like sort of the the soul behind the garment and being able to experience it in VR and sort of see what it's about and what what's the meaning behind it is you get emotionally attached to the garment and like you are so excited about this real world piece after seeing it virtually. So I think that um, to get that emotional involvement involvement in something that's maybe more of a like where you're not buying ten of them, it's like the one like piece that's very important in your 
attached to it, getting that piece as opposed to needing 10 in every color. You know, you do, I don't know if I'm explaining this right. <laughs> no, no. I, I think I get it. If I can try to paraphrase your point, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, um, being a lot more cognizant of the quote unquote slow fashion movement, which was just original fashion, instead of having all these duplicates because we're used to things breaking down or mm. having slightly less choice, you're really cherishing a piece and you acknowledge the work put into it. Um, such as, uh, I'm thinking of this one designer, he actually worked with Prince Charles. I believe it was Prince Charles recently. He's a, a British designer um, that teamed up with the royal family to create pieces that were slow fashion. And I mean, they were sweaters that were costing almost $1,000, but you knew exactly where each piece of this piece of clothing came from, who designed it, how it got to be the way it was, the whole process. And it sounds like that's what you're referring to, watching this thing come alive in a virtual space, understanding and testing out all these different parts of it to make sure it's something you really want to commit to, and then deciding whether or not to pull the trigger on actually making it and purchasing it. And that that's a great example. Is, did I get that right? Did I get yeah, that right? Yeah, that's awesome. about it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Any yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, one of the reasons we, we started to, to dabble with smart fabrics initially was because there's a real problem um, with regards to, uh, you know, climate change and fashion in that lots of people purchase stuff, but then send it back because it doesn't fit them properly. And so we we started to mess around with smart fabrics to truly understand how can we mitigate that uh, that opportunity for someone to return something so that when they purchase something, it's perfect for them. Um, and, and hence, that's why we started to develop these products was to see if we can get some data um, on people's uh, body shapes and then put that in the cloud and then people can have clothes that are made for them that is, specific to their body shape instead of them buying something going actually i don't like this and then sending it back so um i mean fa fashion and it has been for a while is like the second biggest polluter on on the planet um and part of that is to do with these huge infrastructures of transport transportation of, of these goods whether it's um delivery of something or fabrics to somewhere or or x or y or z um and the, all of those problems stem from the customer and we have to kind of create new ecosystems where the customer understands what how much impact affects you know their, their choices affect uh, climate change um so it's like uh, it's, I, I mean I, I, I don't know if that answers your question i guess what, what i'm trying to say is we need to kind of change our perspective on, on what fashion is um to, to overcome these problems Oh, absolutely. Uh, Business of Fashion or, or BOF, the, the organization, uh, for anyone unfamiliar, they're a really, really incredible international group of consultants and designers um, that put out this annual report every year on the status on the business of fashion. And a lot of it has to do with these new ideas about how do we combat that horrible reputation that fashion does have. And, and again, I bring it up because... I want to make the activist point, fashion is an incredible industry full of so much creativity, pulling from all different types of people and, and their ideas about celebrating culture down to utilitarian ideals. How, how do we make this functional? How do we make things beautiful? Such a cool industry. That all to say, though, it really does have this negative impact on the planet. And I think with things like immersive and emerging technology, you're really starting to shift a whole notion of what's possible. But I'm fortunate to give a lot of talks to students at universities, and, and I, I feel very, very grateful to do that because I get to kind of see into what current or, or prospective fashion uh, designers or fashion industry uh, employees are learning. And a lot of these schools are excitedly teaching about um, uh, new ways of design or, or, or new tech, but I don't think a lot of them have, have gone the route that the two of you have in your work. 
And I'm going to go back to your background specifically and, and why I wanted to talk to the two of you on this panel in particular, because you've come at fashion in such unconventional ways. And in doing that, it's really probably how I'm making an assumption here, but it's probably really helped shape what you know is possible for that industry. Mm-hmm. Um, because correct me if I'm wrong, but neither of you directly studied fashion. You wound up in the industry uh, through through other goals and other ambitions, correct? By accident. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I myself as well, I, I work as a, a fashion photographer and director for many years. And then when I started working in tech, I jumped in this way. Uh, Anand, is it the same for you? Um, I've done like fashion illustration for magazines and things like that, but um I, I can't like sew something on the sewing machine. I'm, I'm not that. <laughs> yeah, so we're coming in from, from these adjacent industries with a deep passion. Um, that all to say for the two of you, you know, as, as just like me, not coming from fashion directly, what are things that you want to see that industry change? What parts of technology do you really want fashion to embrace? Um, I mean, what i love about the fashion space is that it's so expressive it's yeah. like music it's like film it's like photography it's like painting what you wear or what you you know what you see is a personality it's an emotion um and that's amazing and mm-hmm. for me what what we try to do at tiger heart is allow our clients to express that expression using new types of technology um, and that's that's a, that's a starting point. That's where where we we have common ground and we start to do some exciting things. But then when we start to uh, try things, then other things start to appear. Oh, didn't, didn't realize this could be something that we could um, explore. Or oh wow, this does this. I didn't know that. And it's only through us exploring this opportunity through technology that we saw that. Um, and so I think what i'd like to see the fashion fashion industry do um is explore technology not because they look at it as how do we how do we make more money or how do we become more efficient but more as a this technology is exciting let's explore it to see you know what opportunities are out there to be even more expressive um and i think that's why tilt brush has just had a, well has been able to capture the, the imagination of so many creatives is because it's a really unique form of creativity. Um, and, and so, so yeah, that's, uh, that, that's my view is I think we just need to, we need to be more expressive with these technologies for the, for the sake of expression. I think that's a great way to put it. Absolutely. Uh, Anand, do you have thoughts? Um, well, Oh, there's all these articles coming out with um, COVID that how is how's the modern concert going to be? How's going the modern um, all these experiences that we miss going to museums, going to concerts, going to events and venues, and those venues becoming in a virtual space. How fun would it be to wear amazing fashion with your friends to these venues, and you're you're there and it. It, it feels so much more real when you're in a virtual space with others and the social aspect of fashion too, like um, putting on a dress and having it swish around when you're when you're moving because it can, you know, uh, react to how your body's moving. Um, and just having like a huge closet of virtual fashions to pick from, say, oh, I'm going to a concert, I'm going to grab this outfit and then meeting up with your friends and what are they what are their virtual outfits and that kind of thing it's going to be so fun i'm really looking forward to it (laughs) (laughs) oh i've been very excited to see um real fashion brands that uh, to both your points have been embracing especially during this time recreating some of their fashions in digital spaces that people can then visit and you have this interesting element of commerce and consumerism and the satisfaction that comes with that for many people. You also have this feeling of accessing exclusivity and possibly luxury or this cool factor that people might not be able to have, whether that's for financial reasons in the real world or they just wouldn't know where to wear the thing. 
Like, I really think that the Met should do a virtual Met Gala and have people come yes. in and be able to, like, design cool things or, or you know, can't, can't you imagine, especially from both of your perspectives on the work of this world, how cool it would be to work on something like that, especially if you made it open to the public? I mean, there's so much potential here, especially fun, expressive stuff um, that just has people thinking outside the box about identity. Uh, Sanja, I think you wanted to jump in with something and I have another question. Um, no, I, I, I guess oh, I'm just, a, yeah, yeah, just, a, a, I completely agree with both of you. I, I thought I, I cut you off before, so I want to go back. No, no. Great. I was going to say with things like couture, I love these amazing couture gowns and these couture things. When is a normal person ever going to get a chance to wear one of those, right? But mm -hmm. you can virtually. And and that's so exciting. I mean, for brands to give people opportunities to wear their couture piece virtually is really, they can have a much larger audience and get a lot more people involved in in their brand. And the good thing about digital as well is you can experiment. So, for example, there's a lot of um, indie record labels that did really well when, uh, well, the, t the beginning of the, the digital revolution, when people started to uh, download music digitally, um, mm -hmm. was because they could see what, they can, what the consumer liked. And with fashion in the digital space, you could just test a few things out. Um, it's, it's not the same as the fashion space, but um, the Fortnite world, um, you'll be surprised how many people I meet on Fortnite who've got like 50 different outfits that they've paid like $10 for each. Um, and when I say outfits, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll look like Venom or they'll look like Spider-Man or they'll look like the guy from Halo or, or X or Y or Z. Um, and it's a huge community of people that are expressing themselves digitally in a, in a, in a fun way and paying for it. So I think now's the time people need to, well, companies need to explore these technologies um, and just see what's, what, you know, what reaction they get. This brings up, um, both of you just touched on things that I'll be talking about in two other panels in this series. Um, both of those respectively are on wearables uh, and wearable tech. And then the other one is about virtual worlds and virtual identity and design. Um, and on the note of both of those, there's such interesting uh, business models for how to make them work. With wearable tech, I think, especially when it comes to HMDs or, or head-mounted displays, things like VR headsets or AR headsets, um, if they start branding themselves, like I've said it for a long time, like luxury brands, and tech is its own luxury, right? But you have Snapchat partnering with Gucci and making spectacles and Harmony Corinne was on, was in on that collaboration too. But when you start going down this road, you start having luxury consumer brand loyalty. And that's something Sanj that you just brought up. And then in terms of virtual identity and virtual worlds and on, uh, there's a lot that comes into play there. But when I think about how finicky all of us are with identity and how we want to represent ourselves, you know, we all woke up today, picked out the clothing that we feel represents us best. Uh, Think about all the implications, good and bad, within virtual worlds and how that can really, really affect, you, and you bring this up, Sanj, too, with Fortnite, how that can affect dollars. And it's part of it is also like, you know, in these virtual worlds, it could help someone with gender dysmorphia and to feel more like themselves and be able to, uh, you know, wear clothing that represents who they really feel that they are and who they are and who they want to be recognized as in as much as brands can step in there and be like, we absolutely see how we're relevant. We absolutely see how we can make money from this, which also just to ruminate on is interesting when you think of slow fashion and you bring up um, an industry player like The Fabricant uh, and, and one of their representatives is also talking in, a, in another panel in this series, but I bring them up because did you hear of the dress they made? It's only digital. And it sold for something like ten thousand USD. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Only, it's only digital, and stuff like that is crazy. I mean, it's very novel, but those opportunities are now existing. Um, this brings up a question for both of you about, in terms of tools and innov innovation. Um, 
and going backwards to talk about maybe AI here, what are your thoughts on the ethics of developing immersive tools for innovating for fashion? I know that's a very, very big topic. But I think about this a lot, especially in terms of like data collection. Like Sanji you brought up collecting data about someone's body. You know, what how how does the fashion industry, how does the tech industry do that ethically in your thoughts with your predictions? And then oh, go ahead. No, uh, the, uh, I, I mean, I was going to say just just with regards to that, I think I think you have to if you're going to build these things, you do have to build with that in mind so that you're building something that is protected, not just uh, a product, but also the people using uh, the product. But it's not until you explore that world that you're going to find these find the problems and you have to be prepared to solve these problems um and it's not it's not an easy easy task um oh. as, as we you know as we all know with 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 how social media has kind of become this entity um and even though there's some fantastic things that have occurred because of it there's also some very very uh, inhumane things that have occurred because of it um so i i i think it's hard to it's hard to predict what will happen but you do have to think about that prediction and how to kind of uh work with it but the the other issue is if you if you invest your mind completely into what could be without actually seeing what could be maybe that what could be could never be mm -hmm. um so yeah that's my thought. My question for Anand to go off of off of that, uh, that exact point. We know the impact that design can have and in terms of your role and then in designing and designing clothing, designing characters, design, designing highly popular um, shows that that are commercially known. You know, what impact does it have to pigeonhole certain design elements in their creation but also to leave them completely open-ended i think about this a lot myself as a creative director you know you sometimes need a box to know what you're working with you need limits to work your <laughs> way out what do you think of that and and sanj just ended on a very important part of that um jumping point um yeah for in being in a virtual space yeah usually uh, you'll find out when you're experimenting in there what needs to happen. Like one of the things was um, personal space. Even though you're in a virtual world, other people getting in your personal space felt weird to some users. And so that you have controls to be able to set a little like boundaries, things like that. Um, so same with like if you have your virtual body measurements, since you're in a virtual space, you should be able to change that. You should mm -hmm. be able to, you know, if you want to be eight feet tall, why not? You can. Like, that's what, those are the kind of things that are exciting is what you can do not in reality that you can in virtual space. And, um, yeah, thinking, so that's like thinking outside of the box. So, um, like, if you have a this amazing dress, what if you, when you twirled it, butterflies came off? Like you can do that. Like there's so many exciting possibilities that you can't do real world, that you can virtual, or even in mixed reality. If you, you know, kind of like Snapchat, if you had, you're in a real space, but looking through a screen, you have, you know, a garment or something on, and then having that kind of cool experience or, or like a Cinderella, like the sparkles come and the gown materializes. I'd love that kind of thing. That would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up the Met Gala, or I brought the Met Gala earlier. Oops, my bad. Uh, in conversation, <laughs> I brought the Met Gala earlier. And there's a thing that I've wanted to do for the longest time, which is design some piece for a project like that, like some, some piece of clothing. But it was... And I'm, I'm going to bring up one of my favorite experimental topics between mixed reality and fashion, which is augmented clothing. Can you imagine designing, let's say, a gown 
or something that could read well in photography, it gets photographed at something like the Met Gala and then say it gets printed in a magazine or online, then people can interact with it via their phones because it's reading whatever tracker is built into that design. I love that concept. I think it's really cool. I think that we're going to start seeing designers doing more and more of those things for interactivity with audiences near and far, people especially that are more tech savvy, that want to start blending those worlds. Do you have any kind of fun examples like that that both of you are just very passionate about that you see as the future? I think augmented fashion, uh, whether it's it's band merch, which has been done before, bands like the Stones have bought into that, even though it's not been widely popularized yet, it's coming. I know it's coming. Down to things like doing augmented couture. Do you, what what do you guys think? I mean, you you both worked in those worlds. What do you see as as the cutting edge? So um, I used to work for an agency called Holition, and um, in 2013 we actually did something like that with a, a cool. an indie fashion brand called Hemica. Um, and it was a really simple idea. You you basically went into this fashion showroom and there were these plinths. You held up a, your smart device up to the plinth and then a model would appear and she would show you the dress using augmented reality. So a really simple idea. Um, and that thing is starting to kind of grow dramatically. And you can already do it with, you know, with with like fashion brochures or like a magazine or or, or any imagery um, and the great thing about it is you can do that with uh, you know Google AR or Facebook AR platforms initially um, and there needs to be more experiences like that I think the problem is that a lot of the businesses that are engaging with it use it as like a sort of novelty they kind of like ah have this fantastic yeah. experience but but let's focus on this and what they really need to do is immerse that technology into whatever the narrative is um that's not easy you know you need you need you need a creative director who's got the vision to to and also the understanding of how to apply that um but it can be done um and it should be done mm -hmm. oh definitely yeah, I can't. I can't wait for it to just be a standard. But there's mm. so much. There's so much good content out there now. It's like I just want those worlds to get. <laughs> uh, Anand, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, well, like uh, some museums were doing experiences where, with your device, you look at a painting and then it has like an animated element to that. Mm -hmm. I think that that is really exciting with fashion that you could really do cool stuff with animated um, like graphics or th or even things coming off the clothing. Sometimes people think, oh yeah, you animate it on the shirt, but it doesn't need to stay on there. It can leave because it's virtual. It can go anywhere. It can do anything. Like I think uh, it's going to get really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. That's, that's what's fun about talking to industry leaders like both of you is that you understand how cool it is going to get because for so many people whether they're you know coming from the tech side the fashion side or they're just not intimately connected to either of those worlds they they don't understand how close we are to making those developments how they're already happening and not just in like the secret laboratories of silicon valley but they're very talented artists designers technologists that are already creating with this um and, and that it will become more and more mainstream. I personally am still so shocked that we're not seeing more musicians that aren't leaning into AR or, or fashion designers. Um, there, there are some fashion designers in another panel, again, in this series, I reference it because they're just, all of you that are part of this, thank you again, are such interesting minds. I'm thinking of uh, two designers that are trying to pull more and more AR into their world but even so, it's just not standard. Um, everything down to making sure that phones, you have the right tech to be able to do those things. Do you think on that note, it's going to be mobile that takes off? There's, of course, a lot of leaning towards that for obvious reason. Or do you think it's going to be the bionic contact lenses that when we're really going to see that that change in terms of fashion and where it's going? In the tech well, it, well it, so you... you I mean, you touched on, you know, you talked about bionic contacts. The, 
the technology has to be seamless the sorry the experience yeah. with the technology has to be seamless um and sometimes when 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 that experience isn't seamless it becomes clunky and then people sort of look at it and go well that was cool but i'm just going to stick to doing x y or z um i think it, again it just needs to start from whoever the, whoever is the creative um, and they need to have the ambition and vision to take it to the next level so that the experience is, um, you know, you can't you can't have that experience unless you have it in this AR space or the virtual space. Um, and we're almost there. I, I, I mean, you I, know, yeah. the, I mean, these tech these these tech platforms have been around for a while now. Some of them are starting to get to the 10 year mark within consumer culture. Um and we're starting to get there. There's that that kind of cusp of this fourth industrial revolution that we're about to hit um, that pulls into lots of technologies, VR, AR, you know, smart technology, uh, wearable technology. We're almost there. It's just I, I can feel us just on that edge about to sort of dive into oblivion. It's exciting. Absolutely. You um, remind me of a topic that I brought up earlier, but we didn't go back to it, which is haptics. Um, especially things like that, you know, you have like gaming vests, haptic vests, uh, sub packs, that kind of stuff. Um, certain VR headsets, uh, any anything gaming associated, of course, incorporates haptics. But I wrote an article um, a few months ago for VR Scout, which is an industry publication for mixed reality, about um, where haptics is headed, according to one specific company that's working in that world. Inner Haptics um, is their name, and how much that is, I think, going to change the fashion industry as well. Not just putting something into your shirt or into your shoes, but that notion of smart fashion and smart tech where we can start communicating in the same way we can with phones. Phones have trained us so well to understand their beeps and buzzes and all of that. And when you start having clothing that my my future, my predictions for, for how tech is going to change clothing in particular is that my shirt is going to wind up being my wallet at some point and that it's going to be the way that I contact you. You know, it, it, the necessity line between fashion itself and tech is growing ever and ever um, more fine. And I think that they're going to, of course, be luxury goods. Those will always exist. But that we're going to have some merge between the two so that we have hyper smart clothing that is basically doing all of our tech functionality for us. And a lot has to change there. You bring up seamless technology integration. Um, but I, I do think that there's going to be an element of, and not just sci-fi, but like commercially friendly or like day wear where we have all of these integrations built into our clothes so that we can just sort of uh, function without all of this external tech we have carrying around. I know that that's very out there, but all of my research is pointing in this direction. Um, Anand, I, I'm, I'm just going to pick on you. I'm just curious what you think about that. <laughs> Don and I are going off on the tech end over here. Um, yeah, and I think AR glasses are going to get, you know, tinier and easier to wear and cheaper and more available. And then Basically, that's a phone on your face. So then you're able to access everything and see all the AR instantly just wearing some glasses. So that's going to by far change things the most drastically, I think. Shout out to, to Bose for making those AR glasses. <laughs> they, they had a shot. They did. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this was really great, guys. We're coming to the end of this talk. Um, I'd love to know any clothing thought, closing, ha, ha, <laughs> look at that, closing <laughs> thoughts, totally unintended, <laughs> uh, closing thoughts from both of you, if you have any, or if any push also for people trying to go into the world of fashion, maybe in an unorthodox way. I think um, just if, if you're watching this and you're inspired, um, just try to find that right community that you can collaborate with so that you can explore your ideas. Um, th there's so many um, uh, accelerators now all over the world um, 
so just just find your local accelerator um, and start to engage with them. You know, if you're a designer, start to design ideas. If you're a coder, start to work with uh, people that have ideas and and try to generate these uh, these visions that they have, um, so that we can all of us can get closer and closer to the future. That was beautiful. Agreed. Yeah, and um, I would say that um, for designers or artists um, that want to join the virtual world, uh, the tool don't be afraid of the tools. Like there's many tools. It's not like the old days where you're 3D modeling and pulling little vertices. It's not difficult like that. It really is like drawing in 3D space and it's natural and flowing and uh, just just start doing it. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, I Both wonderful pieces of advice because there are many of us that work at this intersection between the two industries that combine you know, work from, from other fields as well. But there are not many of us in the world. And there's some incredible designers that are doing groundbreaking work, whether it is in designing the tools themselves or using them in interesting ways or really coming to the table at agencies, uh, creative studios, bringing that knowledge of immersive tech to the fashion industry. Um, and for all those people that, that are out there and doing that hard work, thank you, because these industries are not going away and they're edging ever closer. And we are really lucky to have them because, back to your point, Sanj, it's such an expressive and incredible opportunity to work between the two. Um, mm. particularly fashion and all the ways the tech is improving it. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining me today, for sharing your thoughts and, and sharing what you're about and what you're interested in with the South by audience. I really appreciate both of you and stay safe. We appreciate you. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> it's nice thank to meet you, so you both. Yeah. And now and again. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> <laughs>